Well, last week I uh, spoke about Jerusalem. This week I'm going to talk about Star Wars. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the latest film. So there's an article making its way around uh, the internet over the last few days with a very provocative title. The title is Reform Jediism. The Last Jedi, the story of a community that abandons its religion for an ethereal, universalistic creed. Reform Jediism. The author is Lyle Leibovitz. He is an Israeli-American journalist, author, media critic, and according to Wikipedia, a video game scholar. I didn't know such a position exists, but maybe after my contract is done here, we can look into becoming a video game scholar. Leibovitz was born in Tel Aviv, immigrated to the United States in 1999, and earned a PhD from Columbia in 2007. His father was the famed Israeli motorcycle bandit. Do you know this story? Uh, he uh, robbed Israeli banks, his father did, and then the day after the robbery, he would come back and deposit the money in the bank, according to the stories, if they are to be believed. Um, so that was his father. Leibovitz the Younger served uh, in the IDF as an information officer, and though his yichus, his lineage, uh, and early writings are from the liberal left in Israel, his current affinity is for the hard right. His disdain for Reform Judaism is well documented by his own writings, and his most recent article is no exception. To paraphrase the comedian Rodney Dangerfield in the Jewish world view of Lyle Leibovitz, Reform Judaism gets no respect, because he doesn't give it any. So Leibowitz writes the following, speaking now about the new Star Wars movie. The force is everywhere and for everyone. No study or observance is necessary. You can see where this is going. In addition, the ancient Jedi writings are boring rubbish, and the resistance fighters laughably believe that to be a Jedi, you just have to feel like a Jedi. Leibovitz argues that the resistance fighters and the version of Jediism they practiced in The Last Jedi is the galactic version of Reform Judaism. A small community eager to trade in the old and onerous traditions for glittery and airy creed at univer universalistic kumbaya, like so much sound and fury, it signifies nothing. Reform Jews, he posits, are a ragtag bunch of bagel-loving anti-intellectuals who, with a soft-hearted moral stupidity, pretend at social justice, but do little to advance it. And also, they're boring." End quote. <laughs> so I was tempted to dismiss Mr. Leibovitz as I have been for years, and his article is just another attack of the clones. There will be Star Wars references, I hope you catch them. Just another assault on our modern approach to Jewish life and practice, as the political power of Israeli orthodoxy, which encourages this, continues unabated in the current Israeli government. However, due to the viral, if not vile, nature of his article, and the fact that Star Wars is, in many ways, the sacred cultural text of my generation, the article demands a response. I am defending Torah, if not that one, then the Torah of Star Wars, at least. Plus, it's my last sermon with you, so why not? So first, a little background on the movie, and forgive me if I geek out with you for just a moment. The whole Star Wars The Force theology. I want to first thank my colleague, Rabbi Esther uh, Hugenholtz, for some of these insights. I bow in deference to her nerdiness. In the original Star Wars, the ones that I grew up on, becoming a Jedi was a matter of heroism and calling. In more recent films, they introduced, though, a genetic essentialist component through something called mighty chlorians, or midi chlorians. All of a sudden, you had to be a Jedi by birth of the Skywalker lineage in order to be a Jedi. And then this forces each remaining Jedi to bring balance to the Force and a purpose in life to restore justice to the universe. Think about the biblical Joseph and his responsibility to lead his people, being that he is of the line of Abraham, even though he is conflicted, even though he is not sure. The conflict between the Force and the dark side in Star Wars is the struggle between determinism and free will. It's going to be different than you think. Which is also the struggle in Judaism. Determinism is the very thing, determinism meaning that 
everything is preordained and it's all decided for you and you have no choice. Determinism is the very thing that Star Wars rejects, especially in this latest film, The Last Jedi. We are called to choose between good and evil. Echoing Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16, we are not by nature good or evil, light or dark side. The Jedi theology is that of Torah. It is a matter of choice. As Maimonides, the 11th century rabbi, argues in Hilchot Shuva, the laws of repentance, if a person performs one mitzvah, one good deed, he tips the balance, the scales are that of the entire world to the side of merit, bringing deliverance and salvation to himself and to the entire world. The entire premise of Star Wars is built on this same foundation, a foundation of choice and redemption. The Last Jedi reclaims this philosophical legacy that is so inherent in the franchise. And a spoiler alert, of which there will be a few in this sermon if you haven't seen the film. What makes The Last Jedi the most recent film of the saga so compelling is the main character, Rey, and her rejection, or at least struggle, with this essentialist narrative. Ray, who was a very bright, gifted, and skilled warrior, plucked out of servitude and slavery and obscurity to become the reluctant leader of the resistance, hashtag Moses, holds on to a cherished delusion of grandeur based on a mysterious parentage. She reasons that she must at least be part Jedi, or at least of part Jedi lineage. How else could she explain her giftedness with when Rey's nemesis, Kylo Ren, who has embraced the dark side and traces his own lineage back to Han Solo, Princess Leia, Padme, and Anakin, when he reveals that Rey's own parentage is not of such lineage, but is rather humble and without any sacred lineage, that she isn't born Jedi, she almost abandons her quest. What meaning is her life without her identity? And throughout the movie, she realizes that it's not her identity, but her values that matter most. She looks to Kylo Ren. He has all of this great yichas, and yet he went rogue. He joined the dark side. She chooses the Jedi path on her own terms. It's not who, you, who your parents are, she reasons. It's who you are. And thus she becomes a Jedi by choice. She seeks out Luke Skywalker. Think of him as an old, weathered Rebbe. And he even sports a rabbinical beard in this version of the film. And she begs her Rebbe, she begs him to be initiated into the Jedi religion. Skywalker idolizes books and disdains action. And when she approaches him initially, he rejects her. We can say three times as the Jewish custom, but he doesn't quite do that in the film. Skywalker's reason is telling, and it should be a warning about Jewish survival. Skywalker has lived through the extermination of his entire race. Our story too, right? Almost. Although he's conflicted, he's willing to let the world crumble as long as he can preserve his traditions, as long as he can hold on to his sacred Jedi books. He doesn't represent the last bastion of holy tradition, that is, in Leibowitz's words, quoting, accessible only to those whose orthodox souls are committed to studying its secrets, a notion of historical Jewish practice so romantic it is fantastical. Rather, he represents the failure of his tradition to adapt. As Star Wars fan Aidan Pink, the Jewish Forward's deputy news editor, pointed out, the hyper-rigidity of the Jedi tradition that Luke espouses at this point in the film allowed the Empire to rise and left the Jedi's vulnerable to genocide. Skywalker, deliberately guarding a set of old Jedi texts, but practicing none of their vaunted principles, vaulted principles. He resembles the Karaites of the past and ultra-Orthodoxy of today. Both are Jewish sects that refuse to adapt to Jewish thought that has evolved from strict biblical interpretation to, inc to include the tradition of, of oral Judaism in the case of the Karaites and modernity and reason in the case of modern Orthodox Judaism. In The Last Jedi, Skywalker idolizes books. Jedi and Reformed Jews alike, Leibowitz writes, always bungle their well-intended plans because 
They do not have a solid faith and foundation in the specific rules and concrete decrees. This is evidence, he says, by Yoda appearing in The Last Jedi only to set fire to a tree, think burning bush, that holds the last remaining copies of ancient Jedi texts. And he then tells Skywalker, in his Yoda, Yoda way, let it be. Leibowitz sees this scene through his particular anti-reform, anti-progressive lens. And so in his article, which was, again, so full of animus against Reform Judaism, he argues that Skywalker's letting go is a sin against the ancient sacred texts, ancient Jedi sacred texts and Jedi practices. Leibowitz, in his pejorative way, frames the critical moment as a Shonda. He summarized it this way, quoting him again, to be a Jedi, according to Reb Skywalker, you only need to feel like a Jedi because the old religion wasn't about ethics of the fathers, but about tikkun olam, which everyone can achieve just by being. You know, be a good person. Toss in a few bagels, and you can say that Jediism really isn't a religion, but it's a culture or something. Call it Reform Judaism, end quote. But that's not what Luke Skywalker is saying, and that's not what Reform Judaism is selling. Ultimately, through his own evolution of thinking, Reb Skywalker opens up a sacred path to Jediism for his protege, Ray. He comes to understand through the teachings of his own rabbi of Yoda that the Force is interwoven with all things, just like the Shema is a prayer of oneness of God. It is right there before her, lo ba shamayim hi. It is not in the heavens as the verses of Nitzavim echo in our ears. Skywalker is encouraging Rey to overcome her inner darkness. You could almost hear him say, I set before you life and death. Choose life. Use the Force. And this leads to the moral conflict at the center of The Last Jedi, surrounding Rey's attempt to redeem that nemesis Ren from the dark side, but that's a sermon for another time. The point that needs to be made in response to Leibovitz's article is this. Luke and Reform Judaism are not rejecting sacred texts, but rather pointing out that they are not the sole and separate property of the Jedi. Anyone can access the Force. Anyone can access Jewish sacred texts. Luke now understands through this evolution that Yoda helps him get to, and Leibowitz in his rigid defense of orthodoxy will fail always to see that the way the Jedi have kept their religion is not working. It is spawning deeper darkness. The point of the whole movie and what Leibovitz fails to realize in his clumsy comparison with Reform Judaism is that the force, and here you can read that as Judaism, is not owned by Reb Skywalker. The same way that our religion is not owned by a head priest, a single rabbi, or a single movement. It is not static, locked away under glass, never changing, but it is vibrant and it is alive. Luke, like many of the early reformers of Judaism, realizes that the strictures of traditional Jediism are, and now I'm quoting the 1800s of Reform Judaism platform from Pittsburgh, he recognized that the strictures of traditional Jediism are, quote, apt to obstruct rather than to further modern spiritual elevation. And still there is a note of caution which Leibowitz ignores, and all too often I must acknowledge, we as Reformed Jews ignore as well. The force, or Judaism, without instruction can go wrong. It can lead to the dark side. That's why ultimately Ray takes the sacred books that she thought had been burned and squirrels them away so that she has them. Because she understands a balance must be found between tradition, get yourself a teacher, and modernity, Anyone can access the Force. Everyone needs a Yoda in their life, a teacher, a rabbi, to guide their free access to the Force, to Judaism. Quoting now from Jenny Singer, who wrote on this article for the foreword about the article that was written by uh, Leibovitz. All denominations of Judaism have value, in part because, by definition, they create community. The best hope for maintaining the existence of the religion, of which Leibowitz and I both hold so dear, 
is not interdominational carping over which version of fictional space magicians we each represent. It's deciding how to create continuity in a rapidly assimilating religion without engaging in the kind of rigid thinking that denies equality and betrays any, betrays any values beyond that of survival. Reform Judaism, in its pursuit of creating a welcoming environment, may sometimes overlook what is precious within Jewish tradition, namely ritual obligation and intensive study. And Orthodox Judaism may sometimes treat halakha, Jewish law, too stringently at the expense of its intention, likewise alienating what is sacred within Jewish tradition. But rather than engage in a lightsaber battle to the death, our two denominations and all of those along the spectrum, we could learn something from each other. We could all survive. We have to survive. As Skywalker told Ray, reach out. Rather than knock each other down, we must build each other up. Because the ways of the Jedi, old or new, are still our best hope. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. They are still our best hope to defeat the dark side which is sadly all around us. Ken Hiratsan, amen. I don't know if that was fun to listen to, but it was a lot of fun to write. <laughs> Our service continues, page 586. Please rise, Elenu.